Democracy in Myanmar, I welcome you all to today's special session on the theme of United Against the Burma Army, Ethnic Nationalities Call for Federalism. This is part of the ongoing daily Satyagraha discussion series to support farmers' movements and other development struggles in South Asia. Like the previous online session of South Asia Solidarity Forum for Federal Democracy in Myanmar, this session too is being streamed live on the DRTSPR TV channel of India, thanks to Dr. Reddy, and also on their other social media platforms. The session is also being streamed live on the Facebook pages of National Alliance of People's Movements, Socialist Party of India, CNS, and few others. The session will also be streamed on the Public India channel at 8 p.m. on the coming Sunday. We are grateful to Constance Ruprecht from Thailand, Herman Kumara from Sri Lanka, Kalpna Acharya from Nepal, Nurul Islam Hasib from Bangladesh, Dr. Sandeep Pandey from India, and so many all others for their stellar support from different parts of this region for coming together regularly for solidarity on a range of issues which are so important for the South Asia region. This session, and I'm happy to say that, comprises an all women panel and its purpose is to give the forum participants a deeper understanding of the specific impact that ethnic communities perceive due to the military coup in Burma. The moderator for today's session is none other than Debbie Stothart, a well-known human rights defender in Burma and the ASEAN region. Debbie has participated in every step of democracy building in Burma, organizing advocacy meetings and campaigns on human rights in Burma and other ASEAN countries since 1987. In 1996, she founded the Alternative ASEAN Network on Burma, which we more commonly know is more commonly known as ASEAN Burma. Debbie developed the first ongoing women-specific training program for Burma in 1997 that has since produced many local and national young women leaders from Burma. She was elected Secretary General of the International Federation for Human Rights in 2013. During the last 33 years, Debbie has worked as a journalist, community education consultant, government advisor and trainer in Malaysia, Australia, and Thailand. In recent years, she has helped conceive and implement the first public hearing on corporate social responsibility in ASEAN countries. She also helped organize a business and human rights workshop for grassroots activists in Yangon in February 2013. So over to you, Debina. Thank you so much, Shoba, and good evening, everybody, to this very important uh, uh, topic. Um, at the moment, all the attention is on the civil disobedience movement, which is in many respects um, inspired by the, the uh, by Satyagraha, the, the civil disobedience movement, a passive and nonviolent resistance against the oppressive regime. Um, in this picture, I just wanted to share um, some uh, some slides that would contextualize um, why we are having this meeting. I hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm just going to make it a full screen so that it's easier for you to see. So you can see here that um, arm attacks on civilians targeting or causing harm to civilians has risen during the time of so-called transition. In 2011, there were 424 military attacks that targeted or caused direct harm to civilians. In 2020, it, it was 1,024 attacks, so 143% rise, which correlates with the 180% increase in the military budget between 2011 and 2020. So um, you can well imagine that these increased attacks on civilians were targeting civilians from ethnic nationality areas. Now, um, 
since the coup on the 1st of February, uh, the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners has been tracking the number of people who have been arrested for resisting the coup. And here you can see that the numbers are rising. At the moment, we have 521 people in detention, and many of these are politicians, elected members of parliament, civil society leaders, civil disobedience movement activists, as well as celebrities and members of the media. What is important to note is if you look at this map, the largest number of people who were arrested for peacefully expressing their oppression to their op opposition to the coup were actually people in the smaller ethnic nationality townships. So for example, in Kachin state, 60 people as of uh, mid of 16, 15 November, uh, February, in the first two weeks since the coup, 60 people were arrested in Kachin state compared to 44 arrested in the much, much larger and much more populous Yangon. So, um, and so we are starting to see a pattern here and you will find, you will find that the violent reactions to these protests tend to be um, more intense in ethnic nationality areas, which are already affected by long-term conflict. And, um, and you can see here that um, in, in, this, in this map, all the townships in the country marked in red, there has been some act of resistance following the principle of Satyagraha where, they, where, where people have peacefully protested and these um, protests, these forms of resistance have also been joined by senior public servants as it has been determined that this coup is not even legal under the military drafted constitution of 2008. So um, I hope this will give you a little bit more of an understanding of why we are here, that in even, even as we are looking at this massive and exciting and inspiring youth-led movement against the military, um, dictatorship, this new, new manifestation of military dictatorship, we have to understand that the ones who are taking the biggest risks are people who are protesting in the ethnic nationality areas. And the, these, these communities have been struggling for decades against what amounts to a military occupation at various points in their history, which featured atrocity crimes. And we hope that our speakers this evening, and we have a very exciting list of speakers, um, will give you an understanding, a deeper understanding of the long running questions that we hope this new wave of activism will also address. First up, our first speaker is Moneli. And um, Moneli has worked for the Kachin Women's Association for 18 years and has previously been its former general secretary. She's currently um, an advocacy officer and spokesperson for the organization. Kachin Women's Organization has, has um, of Thailand has amazing, amazing reputation for the uh, work that they have done on women, peace, uh, and security. And Muneli has worked with uh, Kachin women's communities on at the grassroots level in Burma and Thailand to respond to social e and economic issues and the fight for the ability to participate in decision making at all levels. Um, with so I'm going to actually invite um, Muneli to share with us um, um, her reading of the situation and understanding that in addition to her work on women, peace and security, she's also part of the Transitional Justice Network in Asia. 
the Network for Human Rights Documentation Burma and is a member of the advisory board of the Women's League of Burma, the most notable umbrella organization for women engaged in the human rights movement. Over to you, Moneli. Thank you so much, Debbie. And my name is Moneli again. Yes, and every of you already know about uh, what happened in our country in Burma. Uh, that is uh, after several weeks of tension between the elected government led by NLD and the Burmese military, security forces began detaining key leaders of governments. In the early hours of February 1st uh, this year, military personnel began occupy government building and also cutting off telecommunication and arresting elected member of parliament. So we can see that it is very clear 2008 constitution is a uh, uh, give a lot of power to military. So that's why this, uh, according to that 2008 constitution, every time, every night, every day, this kind of the military coup can um, happen in, in Burma. So, uh, so it is also seem like, uh, before it is uh, seem like uh, red and green conflict happen in Burma, but it is really dangerous for our future in Burma. It is, uh, we can see that uh, it is very based on our past experience. So we are really worried for our, you know, future in Burma. So now that is uh, already nationwide the demonstration happened in more than 300 uh, township. And also our common goal is to destroy the military power and against the military dictatorship. It is our big common goal to uh, doing this kind of demonstrations and area, including the ethnic areas. So current the military regimes, uh, under that military regimes, there is a lot of human revolution happen, including in Gachin and also the, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole country. So it is terrible situation happen. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the military uh, regime is uh, released fake news via the um, um, Myanmar TV and the, uh, you know, uh, TV channel. And also many people, in, especially in the young people are taking arrest uh, in the nighttime and including uh, you know, who are involved in the uh, CDM movement. So now uh, every night, every day, our people are worried for their future. And at the same time, they also raise their voices by doing the demonstration uprising and, you know, raising their voice to uh, raise the community, international community and neighbor country or to all of the people from um, the, you know, uh, in the war. So every day, every night, the military and police are come and threaten to the civilians. And also they are doing the crackdown, the demo, uh, demonstration that is by using and their force, like a military force and a police force. And also they are just doing in the nighttime for operating to take arrest and also, you know, uh, make violence to the people. So that's why the people from Burma cannot sleep well in that nighttime. So now, now is what happened. We, we cannot imagine, you know, there is a terrible uh, situation happened in our country, uh, including in the Gachin area. So on uh, 17 of February, there is also some kind of the, you know, um, very terrible situation happened in the rival station in Mandalay. Uh, the police and also um, military come, the soldier come um, to the rival station and also the uh, shooting the gun and to arrest the, the officer because they, that uh, most of the staff and officers are involved in the uh, movement, CDM, uh, you know, this movement. So there is also one kind of the, they are intentionally, there is one of the, you know, transportation uh, to you know, connect to the uh, Gachin state. 
So that's why they have, uh, you know, they have to or uh, sending a soldier and also the Russian to the Gachin area. So it is uh, next day, they are also using this kind of the force to, you know, uh, sending uh, their soldier and Russian to the Gachin area. So we really worry for, um, you know, uh, uh, the people from Gachin state because it will be a, a, a big um, the fighting or conflict will uh, coming and also a lot of human revolution will be coming. That is, uh, we can say that according to our past experience. And on the other hand, there is also ongoing the conflict uh, and fighting between the ethnic armed groups and uh, Burma militaries uh, because they are sending more troops than the ethnic area, including the Gachin state, Gachin areas, and they are fighting between the EAO and, and you know, the military. Even, even the, you know, at the NCA signatory EAO uh, groups. So that's why in the ethnic area, that is increasing the IDP number and also continue, you know, human rights violation and cases happen that committed by the uh, the military. So when we uh, seeing uh, on that continued conflict and the fighting happen in, in ethnic area, there's ongoing the human revolution happening and also war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, happening. And also, especially that is uh, the women's are not very safe uh, in that conflict area. So a lot of sexual violence cases happen and also the IDP situation is also very difficult because of the, a lot of, uh, you know, the funding are cutting into support to the IDP. And at the same time, the military also block to support the, you know, the, uh, the food and some kind of the support, especially for the IDP. So we, um, and another issue Another big problem is natural resources. That is also very linked to uh, continue, you know, conflict happen in the Gachin area. Because this natural resources is uh, only get benefit uh, to the, you know, the military. So, so that's why, because of this natural resources is uh, that grabbing by the military. So they are just, uh, you know, more and more power, especially, uh, in Gachin, in Pagan and, and Danai area. So at the same time, you know, when we are talking about this situation, we can also look back to the uh, peace process, you know, like a so-called peace process uh, before Debbie already uh, give some presentation about the, you know, uh, and, you know, transforming the democratic, democratic transforming something like that. So, we, uh, it is sure we can, uh, we can say that is just with money, a lot of money they already using in that uh, so-called peace process. Because, you know, the military and also the, uh, some um, leader are not really sincerely on that peace process. And also they are not willing to feel fulfill of the ethnic equality and not really want to su uh, support to the uh, ethnic right. So that's why it is also, uh, you know, um, a big problem happened. However, they are uh, trying to doing the peace process and also doing the, you know, under that uh, NCA process. So we cannot get this peace. And under that 2008 constitution, uh, it is really dangerous for, for, for the people, especially for the ethnic uh, people. So we can um, look to our ethnic women. The situation in, of ethnic women is also really difficult and really dangerous. So we have no uh, safety place, especially in the uh, conflict areas. So as um, as for me and our ethnic women's life in Burma, we are struggle for democracy. At the same time, we are also uh, fighting for ethnic equality, ethnic right. And, and also, you know, we are also fighting for uh, our hu uh, women human right. So that's why we are really tired for doing this, uh, all things. Uh, so here, I also want to share about the 
the root cause of civil war happened in our country. So um, every, you know, um, all of you already aware about the, the first peace agreement, uh, we call that Panglong Agreement that was signed in 1947, that is led by the uh, Aung San. So, uh, so that's why this, uh, you know, uh, according to that, uh, based on this Panglong Agreement, we form this uh, federal unions, you know. Uh, so there is really support for ethnic equality and to form as a federalism and, and you know, all of this um, freedom on everything, demo, democratic uh, system is already involved uh, in, in that uh, Panglong agreement. But the, you know, central government never follow and never implementing in, on that agreement. So that's why all of the ethnic people are holding their arm and for or start to fight for uh, their right and for the subdetermination, including Gachin um, people also holding the arm for uh, you know fighting and for our uh, you know fighting for our right. So uh, so that's why there is you know uh, one of the big root cause of the civil war long, you know, uh, long civil war happening in the country. We can also say the most longest civil war happened in the war. So the another thing, uh, military corp in 1962, there is also the first military call ha happened in Burma. So that's why conflict, uh, ongoing conflict and long civil war happened in our country in Burma. So in that situation, every military corp is, uh, we, we see that uh, the same pattern and same impunity. So it is really, you know, uh, dangerous for the people. So current military corp will have the deepest impact on those who are already marginalized due to the decades of civil war and ongoing human rights violation that committed by the Burmese military before the call. So here, I also want to say humanitarian aid uh, must be closely monitored to ensure that in benefit the conflict affected um, ethnic community and not the military. So here we also want to act to the uh, international community and all of our friends to support Burma to establish a federal democratic union that grant uh, self-determination and ensuring a long-term sustainable peace, ethnic equality and protection of human rights for all people in Burma. So, and continuous, I also want to, um, some uh, recommendation is not uh, working uh, with the military regimes and continuous support to the ethnic people and conflict the affected people and also the, you know, uh, civilians through um, uh, as a cross-border uh, humanitarian is supporting or, or yeah, that is also really, uh, you know, uh, affected uh, to supporting to reach to the affected people and also uh, to bring um, military officer, including the me online to ICC. It is also really, uh, uh, you know, important things uh, to, to um, uh, you know, like uh, international accountability. So, and also we uh, also want to call for uh, sanction that sanction uh, should be uh, more widely uh, and also give pressure to release all political prisoner. So that is um, what I want to present tonight. If uh, you have a question or I'm happy to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Munele. Actually, um, I was going to uh, keep the questions till the end, but Christina Fink, uh, Christina Fink has um, has uh, sent a message, uh, a question, which is very directed to you, Moneli. So I hope you don't mind that we ask up up front. Um, by the way, uh, um, Bobby uh, or tech support, I keep getting a message that the host has asked me to start my video. Is that something that I should be ignoring?
Okay, I'm just going to go continue. So Muneli, uh, Christina Fink asks, Kachin politician Ted Tain, Ket Tain has been named the Kachin State Administrative Council Chairman by the regime. How do most Kachin people feel about that? Yes, it is really good question. So as our Kachin people uh, uh, from inside or outside Kachin people, uh, we feel that, um, you know, not, uh, not respect to that person, that kind of person who are just support to the military and, and not support to the, you know, uh, the grassroots people. Since um, they, you know, facing a government, he also working with uh, USDP. So since then, all of our Gachin people are not um, totally not trust to him. Now is also feel we feel the same thing like that. So yeah, it is the same feeling. Now is you know more we not trust and we don't like this kind of the person. Thank you so much, Muneli. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that answer. Uh, for many people who um, have been watching Kachin State closely, the uh, the the war with, between the Tatmadaw and the Kachin people had raged for several decades, and then there was a ceasefire in 1994. But in 2011, during the time of so-called democratic transition, the war on Kachin in Kachin State resumed after a 17 year ceasefire. Um, and, um, and when Muneli is talking about the peace process, it's very important to understand that the peace process has been corrupted because it has set aside some fundamental questions of the protection of civilians, ethnic equal and ethnic equality. Barely a year after the war resumed in Kachin State in 2011, a new war, a new conflict started, was started up in Rakhine State, this time targeting the Rohingya community. With us this evening, we have um, a young Rohingya feminist, Yasmin Ulla, um, a social justice activist born in northern Rakhine State of Myanmar. She fled to Thailand with a family in 1995 and remained a refugee in Thailand until 2011 um, before they, she was able to move to Canada. She formerly served as the president of the Rohingya Human Rights Network and, um, and has worked tirelessly to, uh, to advocate for the human rights of Rohingya communities and beyond with a strong feminist and intersectional lens. Um, she's currently completing her undergraduate degree in political science, but besides that, has a very, very busy life um, doing advocacy and solidarity work across the world. Um, Yasmin, now that we see the entire, the, the world gripped in this drama of what is for unfolding in Burma, Myanmar, in the civil disobedience movement, resisting this, uh, um, resisting a military coup, which was illegal even under the military's own constitution. Where do Rohingya people fit in this call for federalism? Over to you, Yasmin. Thank you very much, Debbie. That was a very kind introduction. And thank you for the organizers for um, inviting me to be part of this um, really, really important and timely event. Um, I'm so grateful to be able to share my panel, not just, you know, uh, with Debbie, who I, you know, uh, love dearly, um, but also, you know, my, my co-panelists who have inspired me so much um, with their work and, and their, um, their tenacity in, in all of the fights uh, for human rights and, and for the rights of their people. Um, the one thing that I, that I realized um, in all of this is there is 
a common thread um, within the, the, the plight of the Rohingya and um, the current uh, suppression, the attempts to suppress the dissenting voices on the ground in Myanmar um, of the civil disobedience movement. And those common threads are psychological warfare, the nightly raids, as my previous as a previous speaker has already mentioned, um, the the shooting of the war, water cannon or the, the dispersing of the crowd is, is a very, very beginning of, of what the military is capable of. And one thing uh, is for certain, they have not changed their tactics for the last few decades and they've stuck through with with their own you know current tactics and um the use of force have been the the the, the more um prominent theme of how they uh try to emphasize their own control and their own power within the country um so the nightly rates are not surprising several several months prior to um, various different uh, campaigns of attack, especially in 2017, prior to the August 25th um, uh, military crackdown on the Rohingya, there were, you know, continuous nightly raids in order to disorient people um, internally. There was also uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, um, uh, attacks um, that are, you know, routinely happening um, all over various different villages. There is a lot of extortion. There is a lot of uh, uh, intimidation and, and fear tactics that have been used um, on the people in the villages um, in order for them to feel um, completely, completely uprooted as the, the crackdown uh, uh, actually begin. And um, as I witness all of this, um, I also, you know, First of all, I, I feel extremely sad for what is happening in the country, um, knowing that that I, you know, as much as this country um, uh, caused a lot of pain, um, became a source of pain for me, um, because a lot of people from my own community have had to leave, um, knowing that there is no safety net for, for my families that are um, remaining in Rakhine State um, to this day. Uh, even at that, I realize that there is such an importance in, in people's realizing their, their will over the military's control, the military's grip for the past few decades. And um, as much as this is a, a really tragic and, and, and something that, that we hope didn't really happen, um, there is also a silver lining in all of this in that people are starting to understand um, the need um, for, for us to for us to actually unify beyond the, the perception of democratic transition that was basically the narrative that the NLD or the civilian government have actually pushed out, um, which was very, very much, you know, repeated all over the world. Um, as, as something to justify the, the slow process or, or, or the violations that the military have committed all over the country. So it's been established that the military, you know, there's so much duplicity with, with, the, with, what, the, um, with what the current military um, coup um, has, has been. Um, there has been a lot of uh, tactics on divide and rule by appeasing various different ethnic leaders, um, even including Rohingya, to actually um, agree to work with the with the military, just just out of the sheer disillusionment of of how the NLD had failed to address their issues. Um, what happened on the ground in Rakhine State currently is relatively calm. There was a restoration of the internet, which didn't really happen for a very long time, almost a year long. And now they have 4G um, internet um, access. And uh, unfortunately, the Arkan National Party actually, uh, you know, the, the Rakhine-led Arkan National Party had actually agreed to work with the military um, due to that, that disappointment of the NLD. Um, and, and because of the, you know, the pain of, of having so many people displaced and, and and um, various other complex issues that are on the ground and, and have been sort of ignored by the NLD. So these tactics of fear and intimidation on the protesters that were used are just, you know, the exact same. And they're just providing a parallel picture of what had happened to various other ethnic communities as well as 
the military try to take control of different areas. Um, one thing that happened, which was a very interesting um, uh, sight, was um, the the uh, state TV appearance of uh, General Min Ong Lang. Um, if you know anything about Myanmar, uh, you probably understand that that General Min Ong Lang was was sort of uh, a, a person behind the genocide um, that was committed against Rohingya. And he uh, has the audacity to actually um, got on the, the uh, state TV and made a plea to the uh, to the international community, saying that he will actually um, prioritize the repatriation process of the Rohingya to be back in, in Rakhine state. He did not give us any details in what will happen, how it will happen, um, whether you know Rohingya will be able to get their homes back or how would the reintegration process would look like. Um, Rohingya can't really, you know, simply we can't really go back as long as the uh, genocidiers remain in power. And he's one of those um, people. It is completely absurd um, if the international community would believe any part of this plan um, that the Rohingya will, will, you know, will be able to, um, to go back and it will all be fine. But the fear is that uh, Myanmar will work bilaterally with the Bangladeshi uh, government without the consultation, without, um, uh, without actually um, playing a, a more informed role in the kind of threat and risk that Rohingya would face going back home without these, you know, these different uh, figures that have played a huge role um, in orchestrating the, the genocide in 2017 and, and beyond um, without holding them accountable in the first place. Um, and they have been, you know, not just orchestrating this in the, in the uh, Rakhine state against Rohingya and, you know, later on against Rakhine people, but they've done this all over the country. Um, and genocide and mass atrocity should not be uh, uh, viewed in in a in a very very light um, uh, sense. It, it should be taken really really seriously in this in this way, um, and so pushing us you know pushing us back in any way shape or form will mean that you're you're pushing us right back into you know into a, a tiger's den, and um, anything that happened after that will will result in in something truly tragic, um, if not immediately, uh, perhaps, you know, in the long term. And um, one thing that he also said in that state appearance was that he continued to welcome the international investment. Um, there is a strong economic incentives in, in, in all of his, um, in all of the, not just General Min Ong Lang's um, plans, but in all of the military's attempts to, um, to you know, uh, realize their will um, in, in emphasizing their power, emphasizing their control um, in the economic uh, realm, but also in the political structure of the country. Now, this is all done to maintain the status quo and, and repress the, the, the dissenting voices that are, you know, rising. And, and the one theme that, that is very prominent and, and some of you might already be well aware of it is, is the resource extractions and dispossession of the lands for accumulation, which is the most important reasoning when it comes to the systemic oppression, um, like the mass atrocity or genocide that happens all across the country. The dispossession part is done with one goal in mind, and it is to further the capitalist agenda, which removes the land rights from the people on the ground and transfer it to the military for them to auction the lands off for foreign investment most times, such as the, the Rohingya um, being expelled. And as soon, you know, soon after that, there is the creation of Rakhine Special Economic Zone. Um, and uh, one of, one of really, really good example of, of that is the Jokpu um, port that extends the pipeline from Rakhine state right up to um, Kunming in Yunnan state in China. And um, there is a lot more of, um, a lot more of, you know, of, of this trend going on across the country in Shan, in Kachin, in, in various other states. Um, now, 
this brings us to to what can be done and and the call for actions that I have for you know for the civil society groups that are that are um, tuning in for the international community. First of all, no one should believe um, that the military is doing no harm to the ethnic communities or the general Myanmar public. No matter how enticing or persuasive General Min Aung Lang or his military instituted parliament may be now and in the future, there is particularly a lot of his recently nominated cabinet members that are extremely problematic. Um, there are a lot of outwardly racist um, and supportive of, uh, uh, of genocide in these in these um, settings, and and this shouldn't come as a surprise, but but. That's the that's the whole um, uh, you know the whole idea was was that he will bring his own people, someone who will you know support his 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 agenda, uh, his his plans and his vision. So these are the same the kind of people that he surround himself with, um, and that you know the the right now the world is running on very very neoliberal agenda where there is a lot of emphasis on capitalist values and and you know not a lot on uh, on the communal uh, connection and the cultural relativism that we where we embrace diversity and and um, celebrate the similarities that we have um, since what the military has done so far in all of the ethnic areas have to do with violence with very clear trend of sexual and gender-based violence what is the aim? Uh, the the what is the aim that the military has in terrorizing the the civilians, especially those in ethnic areas? Again, it's dispossessions. Um, so it is important for us to actually uh, switch our 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 um, or shift our our attempts to actually disempower the military's uh, uh, um, uh, structure in general. Uh, which can be done through, you know, uh, targeted sanctions. This is more broadly um, on the state level. Um, targeted sanctions, not just, you know, uh, towards the, uh, not just something that can be imposed on the on the um, generals or or the individual military um, personnel themselves, but um, on the military-owned companies. Um, this will will help um, divert some of the funding, some of the um, uh, you know some of the uh, some of the monetary value that the military has enjoyed, um, and and you know something that has gone on to embolden the the culture of impunity that is uh, you know broadly just became extremely systemic and infested uh, all all aspects of of the country. Um, the other way uh, that is really, really important for for the civil society groups to do um, is, um, you know, boycotting the military's own company, but also at the same time, support and help the civil disobedience movement. And it should, you know, it should go on to to, you know, to help um, uh, the people on the ground. Right now, the current situation is people are, a lot of people are on, you know, on strike from their work. A lot of people have lost their employment um, during COVID-19 and the mismanagement of the previous, um, uh, the previous administration, including what is happening now had put a lot of people out of work. And um, there is very, very little um, uh, that people can do in order to, to earn um, income and, and to be able to take care of themselves. That is a very, very baseline, a very, very basic um, request that I would have um, is to support them monetarily, you know, support them um, to be able to, to live on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, on top of that, a sustained effort to actually support the civil disobedience movement have to come from the outside. They have to feel like they're being supported because this is going to be a long process. The coup will not, you know, the military will not give up their power very easily. Um, and as more and more people rise up, they will feel extremely threatened and they will resort to any means possible to, to suppress um, the dissenting voices. So I hope that, um, us in the civil society groups or us in the general public will actually not take our eyes off of the case in Myanmar. Um, 
hoping that because this is a larger trend um, all across the globe, it's not just within Myanmar where democracy is being uh, un under under risk. Um, it is, you know, a manifestation of a of a trend that's you know global, and and when we allow something to happen in one country. It generally, you know, bleeds over to other parts of the world because there is this sense of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, people in the position of power being able to get away with their crimes and and enjoying impunity. So um, targeted economic in, uh, sanctions with, you know, by the states um, wherever you are, um, you know, continue to push your your government to do so, and more, you know, more um, on the grassroots level the complete boycott of the military owned companies would be important. Last part is to please detach the civil disobedience movement from the attempts to actually get the NLD politicians released. They are completely different. And, and that's why, you know, the, the, there is a need for us to, for, for the people on the ground to actually, um, look into the the federal democracy a little bit deeper and that's you know that's a process that can happen once this coup is you know uh, uh completely unsuccessful and fail but um there is a need for support um for that narrative um on the outside because there are very uh, there are a few different states that have already sort of um you know, put out that narrative that there's there needs to be a release of the um, of the um, de facto leader, the the NLD leader like Dong Sun Suu Kyi and many more, um, knowing that the NLD will not be a silver bullet for the problems that are happening and have happened for the past few years um, in Myanmar is important because they have failed okay, to- you're running out like, of time. Yes, sorry. Um, like, like Debbie have said, um, you know they have they have failed to address a lot of the issues a lot of the systemic issues so it is important to remember that the the changes that any changes that would happen will happen from people on the ground not you know through the political movement um on 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 a, a government level thank you thank you yasmin so we are hearing some we are hearing similar messages from Muneli and yasmin that the regime is trying to continue this path of divide and rule to try and buy off ethnic participation and compliance uh, with the coup. Um, and the same clarion call for accountability and to ensure that there are targeted economic sanctions against military entities and, and understanding that military aggression also accompanies um, uh, economic exploitation and dispossession of ethnic communities on the ground. Now, our next speaker um, is also a very dear friend, Noah Kushi, a prominent Karen activist, um, um, someone who, uh, through no fault of no choice of her own, ended up becoming um, a refugee because her communities was attacked by the Burmese army. The Karen, the Karen community has been essentially in a state of war for the past six decades. And more recently, 5,300 new refugees were displaced by fighting, by attacks, despite the existence of a so-called peace agreement between Karen leaders and the Burmese Tatmadaw. Uh, Wakushi has had a very long and distinguished career serving as General Secretary one of the Women's League of Burma. Um, she represented Women's League of Burma and Karen Women's Organization, which she also led previously um, at various UN forums and conferences and also at the Global Summit to End Sexual Violence in Conflict hosted by the British government. She's testified in international parliaments, including the Canadian parliament, but um, she's currently coordinator of the Karen Peace Support Network, the largest network of Karen community-based organizations representing more than 20 Karen civil society organizations from Burma. KPSN, the Karen Peace, Karen Peace Support Network, documents the human rights and humanitarian situation in Karen State and has produced several reports, including the Nightmare Returns, 
Karen's hope for peace and stability dashed by Burma Army's actions. It's also important to note that earlier this week, KPSN called for the suspension of loans by the Asian Development Bank to Burma, Myanmar, because of the military coup. I'm going to hand over now to Akushi. She's going to present us with um, a PowerPoint um, presentation. For friends who have just joined us, you've joined the webinar United Against the Burma Army Ethnic Nationalities Call for Federalism, hosted by the South Asia Solidarity Forum, and we stand in solidarity with the struggles for peace and justice in South Asia, including the current farmers' struggle. Over to you, Akushi. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Thank you to the organizer for organizing this kind of uh, event and support the, uh, the call of the ethnic people. So before, can you hear me well? Um, before I start, I uh, would like to uh, say that uh, there are two struggles uh, going on in Burma. And uh, it's, we can see clearly that uh, the first one is the struggle for democracy. And uh, the, the second one is uh, the struggle for ethnic rights, equality and self-determination, for example, the establishment of the Federal Democratic Union in Burma. So that's uh, the two struggle that's going on uh, in Burma. And in the past, uh, we can say that uh, the most of the ethnic people seen the National League for Democracy, uh, NLDS, our alliance. And uh, we also have, uh, our, kind of uh, our common goal. Our common goal was like to bring down the military dictatorship and as well as the, uh, to abolish the military draft uh, 2008 constitutions. And that was uh, uh, our common goal in the past. And um, we can see that uh, like for the ethnic uh, nationality after uh, NLD contested in the election, they feel like uh, they have been abandoned because in the past, um, we think that uh, we will fight together, uh, you know, to in uh, together against the military and uh, try to bring down the military together, as well as try to change the constitution together. And uh, we can also uh, we know that even though NLD did not accept the 2008 constitution, they con they contested in the 2050 elections, and of course, like for them, in order to like to amend and change the constitution within the parliament and uh, they won the landslide victory in 2050 elections. And so of course, uh, we all know that uh, NLD was unable to you know, amend or change these constitutions. And again, uh, they also won the landslide victory in the November 8, uh, 2020. And, um, and we all know that on uh, February 2021, the Burma State, uh, Army a military coup and started to arrest and detain the winning political parties. And now it's led to, into the nationwide uh, demonstrations against the military coup uh, in Burma. So we now we see that uh, most of the demonstrators are calling for the re rejections of the military coup and the release of uh, Dalsa Suji including other political leaders, as well as uh, restorations of democracy in Burma. That's uh, the call that uh, we, like, uh, we see uh, happening in Burma. But at the same time, we also see that uh, the ethnic people also joining, you know, um, it's like, because the, uh, the demonstration is nationwide and also joined by the ethnic uh, nationalities. And uh, the call for the ethnic nationalities is uh, different. And the call is, of course, the common call is uh, the end military dictatorship rule, the abolishment of the 2008 constitution, the establishment of the Federal Democratic Union and immediately, immediately release the uh, detained uh, uh, leaders. So uh, let me tell you why the ethnic people are calling for the uh, establishment of the Federal Union. Why not the democracy? So let me take you to the situation in the ethnic area. Even though, like, uh, even though the NLD uh, won the elections and was in power, the ethnic people continue to suffer and, uh, until today. And we also see that uh, the war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, against the ethnic uh, people and genocide uh, committed 
by the army against the ethnic people was under the NLD quasi uh, civilian government. And so what the heart broken for us was see that the military was, the uh, uh, city was at the ICC defending the military that uh, committed crimes and uh, war crimes, genocide against the ethnic people. For us, we think that that's also one of the, you know, we have been fighting for so long to bring down this military dictatorship. And that's also one of the, you know, the mechanism uh, uh, for us to, uh, to be able to bring down the military dictatorship. But uh, see, uh, the, see the Asa Suji defending the military at the ICG was really heartbreaking, especially for the ethnic people. And then ethnic people feel abandoned again. And uh, of course, the Burma army offensive against ethnic people in our area also continue. And uh, also, as I'm speaking today, we, we can see that over 63,000 uh, uh, newly displaced in Rakhine State in the past uh, uh, months. And uh, uh, the number is reached to over 200,000. And in current state alone, just a few days ago, because of the military, uh, Burma military attacked over 212 uh, current village just had, be, uh, had to flee into the jungle, deeper into the jungle, because their villages have been uh, shelled by mortar. And also because of the military activities, then they have to move deeper in the jungle. And so the number is now up uh, over 5,000, uh, 5,300 uh, recently displaced in the current state. So here is the, the IDP flee, the, you know, the, uh, into the jungle and uh, this is the picture of the woman and this one is the IDP children and on the right side is uh, the children that uh, continue school in the in the jungle even though like the whiteboard is uh, made of a uh, bamboo and uh, these children should be like they also should uh, have the rights same as other children and they should be at the school and should be able to you know eat uh, good food and um, able to go to bed with full stomach like other children, but now they are ended up into the, in the jungle. And uh, this is because of the military uh, regime and their actions. So our analysis on the current situation is uh, the root cause of the crisis is the 2008 constitutions and the long-term military dictatorships. So the army used the 2008 constitution to take over the country. Uh, and accusing the NLG of the election fraud. And the current situation has clearly proven that uh, the current half democracy, half military rule doesn't work and working with the military doesn't work. And it's not worth protecting the military. So that it also should be a lesson learned for the, all of us, should be a lesson learned for the, you know, the NLD, for the Osa Suji, as well as everyone like uh, involved in this movement. And uh, we see that even though of course, we are calling for the release of all the um, political prisoners. And we see that even though if NLD return to power and if it is still under 2008 constitutions, it will not work. And the military can take over power anytime. And this is why this needs to be changed. And, um, and this is why our common cause should be like to publicly reject the coup and the failed 2008 constitutions. And again, um, uh, de uh, demand the drawing up of a new federal democratic constitution. Number two should be a call on the military to stop offensive throughout the country, pull back their troops and immediately release all political prisoners, including those who won't sit in the recent 2020 elections. And uh, number three should be the suspend all, uh, suspend all political financial support to the military regime and impose immediate targeted sanctions on the military owned and controlled companies as recommended by the UN fact-finding missions on Myanmar. And our last point is to resume, uh, for the international community to resume adequate level of humanitarian aid to refugee in the camps on the thai Burma border, as well as provide humanitarian aid cr uh, cross-border to the displaced community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wakushi. Um, um, those have been three very rich, very in-depth uh, presentations, but also really amazing that there are so many re uh, uh, messages and calls to action which are reinforcing each other across Kachin, 
Rohingya and Karen uh, movements and feminists from these communities, these struggles. Um, we have a lot. Um, thank you so much, Wakushi. Um, that was amazing. And we can see that most um, um, of the presentations we've heard from Muneli from Kachin, uh, Yasmin uh, from, from Rohingya and Wakushi from Karen are so mutually reinforcing, calling the analysis is so similar, calling for accountability to ensure that there is more than just a reversal of the coup, that this is bigger than Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD. This is ultimately a movement to have um, a federal system that rec recognizes, respects, and um, protects everyone's human rights and rights to self-determination and equality. We have quite a few questions um, in the chat box. Um, what I'm going to do, um, and I would encourage our, uh, our speakers to um, also choose which questions they want to um, address. I'll read them, I'll read them three at a time. Um, Ativa Savita says, I would like to know what stand different ethnic armed groups are taking in the previous movement. If they can choose only one, who will they prefer to work with, Tadmado or NLD? Shoba is asking, is there solidarity and unity between different ethnic communities in Burma? Because very often autocratic regimes pitch one set of people against another in terms of caste, race, and, and ethnicity to weaken people's movements. And I think the divide and rule is very, very obvious in the Burma struggle. And um, um, would it be realistic that, to, Julie Smith asked, would it be realistic to think that the NLD will be in favor of self-determination for ethnic groups and a federal system if they could rule without the military? Um, so those are the three questions that I will uh, throw to you and I will do it in the same order. You can decide which question you want to answer out of those three. And I'll start with Muneli. Yes, I, I will I will respond on the uh, Remundu. That is um it is uh, about for the uh, federal constitution, is it right? So yes, we have uh, since two thousand four five. Uh, that is most of the, you know, the uh, demo, democracy movement group are working from the exile. And also most of the uh, EEO arms groups are also based in the exile uh, in the Naibu country, especially in the Thailand and Bangladesh and also in the India. So at that time, and um, among that, uh, this EAO and, and democracy movement group, including the uh, as our movement and like a WLB Women League of Burma and uh, youth groups are involved to uh, drafting this uh, federal constitution. Now we have already this kind of the uh, uh, you know uh, drafting constitution already, and at the same time we also are drafting every state. Uh, like a uh, chain stick, a current stick, and you know chain stick, something like that. We also drafting in a stick level, you know, constitution that is very linked to the uh, federalism, a federal, uh, you know, uh, democratic for for this uh, federal democratic country. So that's why it is really uh, important to bring and also risk this our you know uh, our drafting. Federal Constitution to you know like uh, to change this uh, 2008 Constitution, so it will be really uh, good uh, for all of the ethnic people because most of the ethnic people, including the democratic movement and also the uh, women's groups and uh, youth group, already uh, you know uh, give uh, some kind of input in that uh, to to have this uh, draft Constitution. So that's why 
yeah, a lot of energy we already, uh, you know, put in that uh, drafting federal constitution. Yes. Thanks, Moneli. Yasmin, is there any of these three? Please uh, feel free to answer briefly any of these three questions. Um, I will answer to um, Christina. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure who would be best placed um, in negotiating with the military regime. Uh, at this point, I can't really envision um, the moment that the military would be so weakened that it would be forced to negotiate with us. Um, first of all, the military uh, track record has been that they are going to use every mean possible, just as I said earlier, in order to suppress the voices that are contesting their ideas and their um, their you know their power or the appearance of their you know of their power being threatened. So we are a bit of a long ways away from 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 being able to be in the position to negotiate. But if any of that would happen, I would hope that it would be um, not not to be ageist at all. This is this is not have this has nothing to do with that. But I, I believe that that it's time to to relinquish the 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 power to self determination to to recreate the country um, to restructure it to rid it of the power of the existing power, be it the um, military regime or the you know the the previous um, civilian governments, um, uh, which you know, it's a little bit tied to corruption, a lot of corruption that happened under under their administration to rid the country of those, we would need a new set of eyes completely. Um, and and I think that there could be a lot of hopes that to, to be placed in the young people to lead that discussion, at least for them to, um, to lead the way in, in basically creating a conversation on what they want to see in their country um, rather than relying on, you know, the existing narratives on what democracy or what liberty or what freedom would, should look like. Um, and I think that's an old discussion. It's already exhaustive. We, we, we need to move past it already. There, the, the need to hear young people should be because they will have to live with the consequence of that action. And, um, and so if there was any, any, um, possibility of at all for us to envision that at this moment, which we should, but you know, we we're, we're sort of exhausted with the with the current coup and, and the struggle on a day to day basis, which is why it's important to support the people on the ground. Um, if any of that happened at all, I would hope that the young people can lead it and, and truly the power should be in their hands. Thank you. Thanks, Yasmin. Wakushi, are there any of the questions in the chat box that you would like to answer? Uh, uh, would it be realistic to think that the energy would be fever also um, uh, I, like uh, we said that uh, you know if NLD is uh, you know if, if they could have done what the military are doing now you know reserve <laughs> sit for the uh, uh, ethnic uh, nationality ethnic um, group and start uh, working on the you know the drafting of the federal constitutions but now of course, it, it will work uh, working with the military regime, and uh, but uh, I think for me I have um, not much hope, but of course a lot of hope, encouragement, and in inspired by the youth, the young people that are leading the demonstrations, and uh, they are more open, more liberal, and more advanced, and of course uh, there are a lot of hopes uh, for for the next generations. Thank you. So. Um, um, Perhaps we need to actually see a shift in the politics where younger women from all the different ethnic nationalities can, can have a stronger voice and a place in the leadership of the country. Um, I've been requested by um, our host at the South Asia Solidarity Forum to acknowledge Dr. Sandeep Pandey. He was supposed to speak at last week's forum but was not able to join because he was um, engaged at a farmer's protest in Anna Unau. 
Um, Dr. Sandeep Pandey is the Raman Matsese awardee and activist. So please, uh, uh, please, uh, please, we would like to give you the floor for a few minutes so that you can express your solidarity. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Debbie. And I am really uh, pleased to see these uh, young uh, women activists, you know, raising their voice against the military dictatorship. I'm reminded uh, of uh, writing an article on Iram Sharmila when she was fasting against the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in Manipur. Uh, we had gone there to, to organize a five-day solidarity fast in her support. Uh, you know, she fasted for 16 years. Uh, you know, she was not taking any food on her own. Um, you know, it used to be, in, uh, you know, uh, put into her body through a rubber tube through her nose. And at that time, I had compared her with, uh, with Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, who was uh, under house arrest. Uh, and we were very happy that, you know, when uh, uh, she won the election and, and uh, we, we thought the democratic government had been formed. Uh, but all those hopes have been dashed. And uh, also there was certain disappointment with the role of Aung San Suu Kyi in... in uh, you know, uh, not defending the Rohingya uh, people. Uh, but anyway, I guess this is part of the politics. Uh, we, we don't know what her compulsions are. Uh, but we do hope that, you know, democracy will return to, uh, to Myanmar soon. And I see uh, there's so much similarity between, between what is going on in Myanmar and, and in India. Although uh, we have um, uh, a democracy, but the nature of the government is uh, very fast turning to autocratic. Um, we have, you know, the farmers movement going on at this time, which gives us a lot of hope. But otherwise, a lot of things that were being described uh, by Yasmin, for example, nightly raids and, you know, house arrests. And, and filing uh, false cases, putting people in jail, um, you know, uh, torture and uh, such things are going on in India of, you know, number of our um, intellectuals are in jail at this time, uh, you know, on false cases. So, uh, you know, uh, military is being given more importance, more spending on military. Uh, the state is using the security forces against people who are dissenting so uh, all this is is you know very scary and and uh, we uh, stand in solidarity with the people of uh, Myanmar as we fight our own struggle to save democracy and and uh, hopefully you know get rid of this right wing government in power at new delhi uh, we hope that together all of us you know including people from different other countries who have joined uh, this uh, this uh, webinar uh, from Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, um, and and uh, you know there are colleagues from India. So we hope that all of us together <clears throat> can work to make uh, this uh, area, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and also uh, the world a better place to live in for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandeep Pandey. Um, we are actually running a little bit over time and there's still so many questions that remained, uh, remain to be answered. Um, uh, I just wanted to note that North Susan Hillary asked for recommendations for Korean people and other ethnicities on how to abolish the 2008 constitution. My recommendation, North Susan Hillary, please join Wakushi at the Karen Peace Support Network and you will know what to do. Raimondo Bultrini from La, La, uh, La Republica newspaper. Is there any specific common federalist platform for ethnic groups? Yes, there is. In fact, as Muneli mentioned, they had been organizing lots of workshops and strategy meetings and even discussions on drafting a truly federalist constitution even before the transition to the quasi-civilian government in 2011. The discussions on federalism have been going on for 
probably close to 30 years now. So it's not that people don't have a path or a plan. It's that they have been deliberately marginalized. Julie Smith wants to know if there is a list of military companies which can be um, uh, targeted for boycott. Julie, uh, Burma Campaign UK has a dirty list. You can find that very easily online. But also, the UN fact-finding mission issued a report in 2019, and that is an official UN document which describes military companies. I'm going to have to wrap up here and say thank you to everybody who joined us. Thank you to the seven Facebook groups which are simultaneously streaming this session. I hope more groups will, will share it. Um, thank you to our friends and the expressions of solidarity and even solidarity plans, which Herman Kumara is already setting up with Bobby Ramakant even as we speak. Friends from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Palestine, Wales, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Germany, USA, Luxembourg, UK, India, and Japan that I am aware of. I think uh, Camilla Buzzi is, is, is logging in from, uh, from Norway. So this is goes beyond South Asia uh, uh, solidarity. This is a global solidarity. Let's keep up the struggle. Let's keep on working together for social justice across the world. Thank you, everybody, and stay strong. And back to you, Shoba. Thank you very much, Debbie. Nothing left to say. And once again, special thanks to Yasmin, Muneli, Wakushi, and of course, Debbie. So all power to the woman force and may better times prevail. Thank you and good night. <laughs>